All right, glad to see you uh, this morning. We're uh, in the Exodus for Beginners class. This is lesson number four in the series. The uh, title of this lesson is The Genealogy of Moses and Aaron, and that is found in chapter six, verses one to 27. So in our last lesson, Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and with Aaron performing miracles and speaking Moses' words uh, to the Jews, as they succeed in uniting you know, the people behind them. They then go before the Pharaoh with their request to allow the people a three day break to go into the uh, wilderness uh, in order to worship their God. Uh, we know that the monarch flatly refuses them. He accuses the people of laziness and as punishment, he forces them to supply their own straw for their brick making operation while producing the same amount of bricks. So this creates dissension uh, among the Israelites who blame Moses for provoking this crisis, which threatens not only their livelihood, but it, it threatens their lives. Moses in turn blames this seeming failure on, on God. This is where we uh, pick up the, uh, the golden thread uh, at the seeming destruction of the Israelites by the hand of the cruel uh, Pharaoh who is uh, threatening them. And so we're uh, in the uh, second uh, part of the deliverance, deliverance number one, you know, the first attempt at deliverance, chapter one, verse one to 6, uh, 27. We've seen the initial failure. Uh, we continue with that, the first meeting with Pharaoh, uh, Moses and Aaron's uh, genealogy is what we're going to talk about in a moment. And we begin with God's reassurance to uh, Moses and to, uh, to Aaron. So after uh, their humiliating defeat before Pharaoh and the Jewish people, God renews both his promises and uh, gives Moses and Aaron even more challenging um, instructions. So we read chapter six, verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh for under compulsion, he will let them go. And under compulsion, he will drive them out of his land. Well, once Moses has you know, spoken to God recounting what the Pharaoh uh, had done to him and the people and how all of this was God's fault, God responds with what he will now do to Pharaoh. He doesn't even comment on what, what Moses said. God will use compulsion. Uh, the RSV says a mighty hand to compel the Pharaoh to let the people go. The Pharaoh, of course, anxious to see them leave, would also force the people he once held captive to leave his nation, something at the moment that seemed impossible. But God is saying, you'll see after I'm finished with him, he'll, he'll demand that you leave his country. So here God is summarizing what will happen in the future so that they will know it'll be through God's will and power that the people will be released. So their first experience and failure with the Egyptian ruler convinced them that he was absolutely determined to keep the, uh, the Israelites captive in Egypt. Uh, no doubt about this. So we continue reading. It says, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty but by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. So God provides a, a kind of a history lesson based on his name. So that first and foremost, Moses will understand who he represents and who will be responsible for the things that are about to happen. First of all, 
He has been known as God Almighty, El Shaddai. El Shaddai pronounced. Uh, this is what he's been known as to Moses' ancestors, more specifically as the Lord, Yahweh, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He was not one of the Egyptian deities or some new divine being, but the God of the, that golden thread we're talking about, uh, which he describes next. He is the one who appeared to the patriarchs and made a covenant or a promise to give them a land of their own. And he even names the land, the land of Canaan. Even though three, uh, these men knew that it was you know, the same God that appeared and renewed the covenant with each of them in successive generations, they did not know him to the extent that Moses and this generation would come to know him. And I don't think Moses was understanding what a blessing that would, uh, that would be. To further connect the past and the present, God tells Moses that the reason for his appearance now is the promise that he made you know, long before, centuries before. The bondage of the people uh, and what they are suffering now is interfering with God's purpose and his plan to give his chosen people the land that he promised to give them long ago. So the bondage that they're suffering isn't something permanent, not in God's eyes. It's actually uh, an impediment uh, for him uh, to complete his promise uh, to his people. And so God reveals the big picture to Moses. What's about to happen is not a singular event, but rather part of this thread that I've been talking about that stretches back to Abraham and will ultimately lead to God's people entering and possessing the land promised to their ancestors. Of course, we know today that the thread was to stretch further into the future. However, for Moses, just the thought that what was taking place connected the past promise of God to a future fulfillment, and he was at the center of it, you know, that was, that was a lot to take in. So we continue reading verses uh, six to eight. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great uh, judgments. Then I will take you for my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So in these verses, God gives Moses a, a summary of what he is to say to the Jews as God's spokesman, a role and a communication model that was new. I mean, up to this point, God had only interacted with individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Jacob and, 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 and he would reveal his will to these individuals and he would make promises and he would establish covenants uh, with them. This provided knowledge of him to specific families and specific clans. With Moses, however, God was raising up a national leader, a single man who would speak to an entire people on behalf of God and to other national leaders like the Pharaoh on behalf of his people. This was a new form of communication. In verses six to eight, Moses is given his first major pronouncement to make on behalf of God. It contained three parts. Part one was in verse six. Introduce to the people on whose behalf you are speaking. You're not conveying the words and commands and promises of Moses, but those of the Lord, of Yahweh. This is the same Lord that spoke to your forefathers and revealed himself through appearances and through signs. Moses was to announce the plan of the Lord for his people. First, 
he would free the people from bondage. And secondly, that he would do this with a display of power. Secondly, tell the people that the Lord was to take them as his people and be their God, thus establishing an exclusive relationship with them. Remember that many of them may have still remembered the promises of old. You know, after 400 years in Egypt, they had been thoroughly indoctrinated in the belief and the worship of the pagan deities of Egypt. One feature of this relationship will be that not only will God know them, they in turn will know their God. He will not be a mystery to them. And one of the first things they will know because they will actually see it for themselves is the power that he has and will use on their behalf. This power will be used and seen as God will use it to free them from Egyptian bondage. And then the third part in verse eight, God will fulfill the promise made to Abraham and then renewed to Isaac and then again to Jacob that he would give them a land to possess. Moses' role would be to lead them to this promised land. And so we see that in these few verses is contained an outline and a summary of Israel's experience recorded uh, in the uh, early books of the Old Testament. Here we go. God delivers Israel from Egypt, Exodus chapter one, verse 18. God makes Israel his people. Exodus 19, all the way through the book of Leviticus. And then God gives Israel the promised land. We read about that from Numbers all the way to the book of Joshua. So we get back to our passage, verse nine. It says, so Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. So instead of being encouraged with Moses's message, which I've given you a summary of here, a message of rescue and hope, the people refused to listen or to respond to him. They were despondent. In the Hebrew, uh, that means uh, they had a small spirit because the Pharaoh's strategy of breaking their spirit with harsh labor and no hope of recovery was actually working. The Pharaoh seemed to have won his first encounter with the God of Israel by you know, uh, giving a small spirit uh, to his people. So we keep reading verses uh, 10 and 11. It says, now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, go tell Pharaoh king of Egypt to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Uh, once again, God gives Moses a renewed charge to go to the Pharaoh and demand this time that he release the Jews. And again, this time with no explanation that it's for a time of worship, that, that's, that's off the table, just let us go. Verse 12, but Moses spoke before the Lord saying, behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. So Moses falls back, you know, he seems to forget his conversations with the Lord at the burning bush and reverts back to his previous excuses that you know, he's not a good speaker. He's still thinking like a like fleshly thinking. You know, I'm not eloquent. I can't reason. Remember I said to you, when we're dealing with God, we deal with God on the basis of faith, not on the basis of reason or, or logic. And he's still dealing with that. And so he's telling you know, God, the actions of the Pharaoh seem to have made his spirit, meaning Moses, his spirit small as well. If the Israelites have rejected me, Moses says, uh, how can I hope to win over the Pharaoh? And so in verse 13, then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. 
So how does God respond? Well, he responds by renewing his charge to both Moses and Aaron, along with instructions as to what they will say to the Israelites and to the Pharaoh. In his charge, God encourages his two servants and clarifies again the mission, the release of the Israelites from Egyptian captivities. You know, sometimes when we fail at something, we, we, we focus on the failure itself. We focus on our own personal weaknesses or the reasons for giving up and the difficulties associated with the task. Here we see that in renewing their charge that God doesn't deal with any of these issues. He simply clarifies the mission. So their focus will be on the mission itself which is obtaining the release of the people and not any of the obstacles in the, uh, in the way. So now in uh, chapter six, verses 14 to 27, uh, we read about the genealogy, very, very interesting. The genealogies of, uh, of Aaron and, and Moses. The genealogies, of course, maintain the historical record of those people associated with the Bible and especially that golden thread, you know, uh, it's, the, it's the genealogies that, that uh, associate or connect the people of the golden thread uh, throughout history. So they're very important. In Genesis, the genealogy narrows the line of mankind in general to the specific line of Abraham. Then it narrows it still more to Jacob in order to focus on the seed through whom God would bless the world. So in Exodus chapter one, verses one to five, the, the thread identifies the men who were the heads of the families of Israel at the time when they first arrived in Egypt. This answers the question, who were the people delivered by the Lord from the Egyptian bondage? And the answer is, the descendants of those people, which people? You know, those 70 people, the descendants of those 70 people, those were the ones who were freed from Egyptian bondage. And so in, in Exodus chapter six, we have another genealogy that answers a different question. And the question is, of the descendants of the people mentioned in chapter one, who were the deliverers of the people? Who were their ancestors? Where do they fit in? And the answer is Moses and Aaron, who were the descendants of Levi. So you, you have this uh, genealogy here, if you can follow you know, the, uh, the, uh, the diagram that I've shown you. If you look at the top, Levi, he was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And then the other individuals underneath are the descendants of Levi. So if we, if we look at the descendants of Levi, uh, you know, we have uh, Gershon and Kohath, and we have Jochebed, who was the daughter of the tribe of Levi and Merari. Uh, but if we look at Kohath in the middle there, uh, he was also the father of Amram, who uh, married Jochebed, all right? And, and, and there are other individuals, you know, uh, Izhar and Hebron and Uziel and Mahi, but uh, those are not the ones we're interested in. The ones we're interested in are Levi, you know, the, one of the sons of Jacob, Kohath, one of his sons, Amram, one of his sons, and then Amram married Jochebed and they had Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. And so the answer is, who are the deliverers of the people? Who were those people? Where did they come from? Well, they are descendants of Levi, uh, uh, Aaron and Moses and Miriam. And then of course, we have Moses, his two sons, Gershom and Eleazar. And then uh, of course, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, who became priests along with Aaron, who was to become eventually the high priest. 
And so uh, someone will ask the question, why is there a genealogy at this point? You know, I mean, we're in the, we're, we're in the thick of the battle here between Moses and, 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 and the Pharaoh and uh, releasing the people. And then all of a sudden, whoops, right in the middle of all of this, a genealogy is given. It would seem a strange place in the middle of the action to place this genealogy. Note that this genealogy is placed between two key parts of the story. First, Moses' first attempt to get Pharaoh to release the people, which ended in failure. God responds by insisting that Moses and Aaron return to Pharaoh and try again. Chapter six, verse 10. Then we read further on in 28 all the way to, or 628 all the way to chapter 12, that the second attempt was successful. And in between these two attempts, a genealogy is placed which focuses attention on those Israelites who will become the priestly line. Since Levi was the father of the priestly tribe, the genealogy features him. Since Aaron was to be the first high priest, the genealogy highlights him and his family rather than Moses's family. Note that Miriam, Moses and Aaron's sister, as well as Moses' two sons, all mentioned elsewhere, are really not included in the text here. I've put them in the, uh, in the diagram to show you where they fit, but they're not in the text. Also, Amram, Moses and Aaron's father, married Jacobed, who was his father's sister or his aunt. We know that in those times, there were unions permitted uh, that were eventually forbidden by the law that was given to God, uh, by God to Moses. So Aaron was the first high priest succeeded by Eleazar and in the next generation by Phinehas to whom the Lord gave uh, and his descendants a covenant of perpetual priesthood. And we would read about that in Numbers uh, 25, uh, 13. On that note, the promise and description of Aaron's ultimate role in this mission, he will become the first human spiritual leader of the people of the golden thread. We already know Moses' role is to lead them out of bondage into the land of promise. With the confirmation of both of their roles, which they haven't yet fulfilled, the story of the first attempt at deliverance of the Israelites is concluded. In our next lesson, we're going to begin the action as the Lord sends both Aaron and Moses back to the Egyptian monarch for a second attempt at freeing the people of Israel. All right, well, we'll stop there in our textual study. Again, a couple of lessons that uh, I'd like to uh, develop from the material that we've uh, looked at so far today. First lesson, God knows how to encourage his servants. Because we see a lot of that in you know, these passages, the ones that we've read today. Warren Wearsby, a prolific Christian author and teacher noted that Moses became discouraged, but did what all Christian leaders ought to do. Uh, and that is bring their problems to the Lord. Moses did this and God encouraged him in ways that only God can encourage. You know, God can encourage you if you're having problems and instead you mope around or you become depressed or you're angry at God and you don't want, you don't want to talk to him and you know, he can't help you that way. But if you are depressed, angry, fed up, you know, discouraged, small spirit, and you bring all of that to the Lord in prayer, he's able to, he's able to work with you. He's able to help you. And that's what, that's exactly what Moses, Moses did. And we see how God can encourage. First of all, God reminded Moses of the promises that only he could make and keep. 
For example, he reminded Moses who he was, God, and what he had done in the past. He had made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to give them the land of Canaan. He reminded Moses of his name, Jehovah. He was the true and the living God. And finally, God assured Moses that his mission would eventually be successful. Don't worry, you will succeed. You know, it's one thing if our parents or our friends encourage us and they say things like, uh, well, don't quit or you can do it or how do you know if you don't try or I believe in you or I'll help you. I mean, these are all good and sincere things, but there are no guarantees of the outcome. You might still fail despite all this encouragement uh, from your families. However, when God encouraged Moses, he assured him with things that were there and that were for sure. For example, that God would be with him, that in the end, the king would release the people, that he was going to lead the people to the promised land. You know, when God tells you, you're going to do these things, I assure you, it's, you know, my wife and I have this thing, we watch movies sometimes and, 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 when, and when somebody in a movie, you know, there's a dramatic scene, uh, some, something bad's happening, somebody's trying to make it better. And he says, usually it's a man, he usually says, uh, this is going to happen, I promise. You know, our child is lost, I promise I will, I will find him, or I promise I'll make this good, you know. And we look, we always look at each other and we smile. Why? Because who are we to make promises like that? We can't promise. But when God promises, ah, that's a different story. When God promises, now we have something uh, that is sure. God doesn't simply provide encouragement. He gives assurances that what he promised, he will deliver. So whether it's a promise that the Pharaoh would, re, uh, would relent and allow Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, or his promise that no matter how weak and sinful you see yourself, or Satan has convinced you that you are you know, uh, irredeemable, God promises that all your sins are forgiven in baptism and that uh, you will be with him in heaven after you die. This is not an encouragement. This is a promise from God. Another lesson taken from this material. Many times our trials come about simply to teach us something about God and not ourselves. Most Bible lessons dealing with difficulties and trials end up teaching us to grow in certain virtues like patience or trust or perseverance. However, sometimes it's not about us, but about God. In other words, it's about what he's like and how he acts. For example, Job you know, is a wonderful story. After all that suffering, he learned that he didn't know God like he thought he did. It wasn't about him. You know, throughout the book of Job, Job is always talking about, it's about him. It's not fair. Let me defend myself. You know, let's have a court trial and you know, I'll present my case. It's all about him. And in the end, he realizes it wasn't about him. All of this happened so that he could recognize you know, who God was and how God was. Another example, each time Moses went to God with his problems, he would come away with new knowledge, not about his problems, but he would come away with new knowledge about God's character and God's power and God's eternal nature and his patience and his plans for the future. A little while back, I remember falling ill quite suddenly over you know, two, three years ago. I remember the day even, one minute I was eating and I was laughing and I was with the brethren at a men's breakfast. 
And the very next minute I was nearly passed out. I was on my couch in my office. I was nauseous and dizzy and sick. And that day began a long journey of illness and doctors and tests and physical decline and weight loss that continued for almost two years. In a feverish moment of prayer one night when I was especially in pain and discouragement, I had a wonderful moment of clarity about God that brought me great comfort and peace in the middle of the noisy battle of my illness. The, the thought came to me that God does not change. He's always the same. He'll always be the same. He never, never changes. Now, I knew this intellectually, you know, the changeless God, but only after undergoing all the change in my body and in my mind due to my illness, did I grasp for a precious moment the divine attribute of his never changing nature and being. How comforting it was as I was going through all of these changes, negative ones, he, the God that I worshiped, the God that I depended on, he never changes. This more informed knowledge of him brought me peace. It calmed my fears about the rapid deterioration of my own body. You know, the illness that changed me also enabled me to see more clearly and thus be assured that God doesn't change and all without a word being spoken. He is truly the portion of our cup and the knowledge of him is eternal life. Well, that's our lesson for this week. I hope that you've gained some insight to the book of Exodus and hopefully some lessons learned about our Lord himself. Next week, uh, we're going to go into deliverance part two. Moses goes back to uh, the Pharaoh and the action, you know, God's action uh, really begins uh, in earnest. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to read chapter six, uh, to chapter 12 in the book of uh, Exodus, and that will help you uh, follow along more easily as we go through the material here in class. Well, thank you very much. God bless you. And if the Lord is willing, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.